Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the April PQA Quality Forum. We'll get started here in just a minute. I encourage you to get your copy of the Pharmacist Provided Care Action Guide following the website that's there on the screen. We'll wait for the attendees to join in here, and then we'll get started very shortly. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the April Quality Forum. This is a monthly quality, monthly forum rather, uh, for PQA members. We generally use these forums to promote the use and impact of PQA measures and other healthcare quality topics. We are thrilled today to be able to discuss the Pharmacist Provided Care Action Guide, as it was just released earlier this month. And we're looking forward to highlighting this report um, as well as the, the feedback that we've received on it. Your speaker today is myself, Lauren Kirk. I'm the Director of Stakeholder Engagement here with PQA. My primary job responsibilities are to play the matchmaker between our members and our value opportunities, whether that be in measure development, education, research, or our meetings. But in this context, I had the pleasure of working with our members as a project manager on this uh, Pharmacist Provided Care Action Guide project. So before we dive in, let's cover a few webinar logistics. You have the opportunity to ask questions throughout the webinar today, and I will be having a few reminders throughout the presentation. You'll need to use your control panel to send those questions to us, and we'll be looking forward to working through them and answering them on the webinar. They will also be recorded if we do not get to your question on the webinar today. We'll be able to follow up via email uh, with a response to that question. Today's forum is being recorded, so that'll be a benefit to our PQA members as they will be able to access this recording later. It's, uh, we're also recording this in order to uh, terrify me into not saying something I shouldn't. So, um, luckily this is being recorded. And then of course, uh, following, the, uh, following the completion of the webinar, we will, we will prompt you to fill out a quick survey. We encourage you to submit your honest and candid feedback through that, uh, that portal. So if you're just joining us and have not gotten your copy of the Pharmacist Provided Care Action Guide, I encourage you to follow the link there on the uh, screen in order to access that action guide. It'll be a very easy and useful reference to follow along uh, through today's presentation. And of course, a nice reference for you in your practice setting once we finish the webinar. Before diving in, I wanna make a few announcements about upcoming events and opportunities. Of course, coming up next month, May 15th through 17th in Baltimore, Maryland, we will be hosting the PQA annual meeting. I encourage you to join us uh, and learn and engage with our uh, medication quality leaders. And I also remind you that the early bird registration deadline ends tomorrow. So jump through that website there or follow that link to the website there in order to register for the PQA annual meeting coming up next month. While the quality forums are one offering of education that we, we offer to our members, we wanna know what else our members are looking for as it, as it pertains to their education needs. So follow that link there in the middle of the screen uh, to give us your feedback on the educational needs assessment. We request your feedback by May 2nd, but of course, always look to hear from our members about the education needs that they have throughout the year. And then finally, to the far right, um, we are proud to announce that we have, for a second year, our second year, 
participated and partnered with Pharmacy Times in the Directions in Pharmacy series. Uh, PQA will be a keynote uh, speaker providing um, a keynote on the opioid legislative update. And uh, throughout the entire program, you have the opportunity to earn nine and a half CE credit hours. There are three locations remaining there across the country. And we encourage you to use the code PQA to receive a $60 discount on the registration for that particular meeting. Follow the link there in order to learn more about that programming. So now that we have the logistics done, we have the announcements are checked off our list. Let's, uh, and, and of course, everyone now has a copy of the report. Let's talk about the strategies to expand the value-based pharmacist provided care action guide. We'll start with the, first, the big pictures. So what's out there and how, and what is the context around this uh, action guide. So patient engagement and a holistic approach. Pharmacists, as uh, as we make as as is commonly known, are well positioned to deliver care, and that care can be centered on patient engagement at a regular interval, and really looking holistically at the patient for all opportunities to provide care or deliver an intervention. Value based is uh, is pre is based on our, uh, the movement of the market from volume to value and uh, in the coinciding movement from fee for service to pay for performance. So this value-based focus, this value-based uh, approach to any type of care delivery meets the needs of not only the patient, but also the payer, as well as other stakeholders. It also looks to achieve shared outcomes, not just those of one particular uh, stakeholder group. That said, in order to achieve those shared outcomes and to meet the needs of all stakeholders, partnering and collaboration will be required. And then finally, the far right is pharmacist provided care. When one combines patient engagement and a holistic approach with value-based approach, then you, it yields the pharmacist provided care. And that can be ba basic a collection of information about the patient, the assessment of the patient, the potential uh, interventions that could be identified or acted upon in order to deliver better care. And then, of course, proactive engagement of the patients, whether it be through services such as medication synchronization, medication therapy management, or the delivery of immunization. So now that we have the context, let's talk about the project that that developed or the process that developed the action guide. The, the project had two phases, uh, the first being an industry survey and the second being a multi-stakeholder task force. Throughout each, PQA engaged all of our members or rather our members that are coming from the community pharmacy stakeholder base, the payer stakeholder group, and the health technology uh, vendor uh, stakeholder base. So. We, throughout the industry survey, surveyed more than 50 organizations to discuss with them pharmacist-provided care, MedSync, appointment, the appointment-based model, value-based pharmacy networks, pay-for-performance, and pharmacy performance tracking. So we ran the gamut of the hot topics uh, that we talked about on throughout our industry survey. We then took those results, collated them, and brought them together to a multi-stakeholder task force. Over 25 experts joined us uh, to look through that information and intel gathered during the first phase, and then look at the testimonies of the successes and opportunities in the collaborations between pharmacies and payers. With the goal, of course, to not only develop this action guide, but more indirectly, spark collaboration and partnership between you and other stakeholders. So I do want to take a moment to thank those that participated in not only the industry survey, but also the multi-stakeholder task force, this work and this product, and this webinar, of course, could not be possible without your participation and help. As we work through the report today, I wanna to be clear in that what I am speaking to 
are the um, are the points that we discussed uh, in this multi-stakeholder task force and the information learned through the industry survey. And again, the goal of our webinar today, as well as the report, is to spark action and and inspire you to begin to take action in advancing value-based pharmacist-provided care. So, first though, I do want to know who exactly is on our on our webinar today. If you had to identify the stakeholder group that most accurately describes you, what would it be? I'm launching the poll now. Please select where you might fall. So we'll close in about five seconds. So if your answer is not in, go ahead and submit that response. And we'll go ahead and close the poll and look at our results. So we have about 64% of pharmacists on the call today, 12 of payers, and 24 of others. I'm always encouraged that we have others that are included in here and would be curious to know what membership sectors or which stakeholder groups you all are representing. So please feel free to submit that into the questions box. I'd love to hear who else besides our pharmacists and payer stakeholder groups are being represented. So now that we know who's on the call, I'm going to call you all to action here, not necessarily via phone call as is uh, visualized there, but I encourage you to use these actions. Take note of the actions that uh, most resonate with you and that you believe that you could you could pursue within your own organization. We encourage you to foster the adoption of pharmacist-provided care within your organization. So we'll take a look at these 15 recommended actions, those five for pharmacists, five for payers, and five for pharmacists and payers to do together. We'll also cite some real-world real, real world examples of how pharmacist-provided care programs are being, being implemented and those that have been successful. And of course, look at some industry trends in pharmacy practice. So let's begin to look at the industry trends here. So we have five trends that emerged from our industry survey and multi-stakeholder task force. And these trends uh, you will be able to see throughout the recommendations and really provide a solid foundation for all of the recommendations. Let's look at the first one of transformation. As I mentioned, the market is transitioning from volume to value and fee-for-service to pay-for-performance. And of course, as this transition is happening, transformation by all stakeholders is necessary. Change and adaption is necessary. And what particularly in the model that community pharmacists practice there in, uh, in, in delivering care. That second uh, industry trend, outcomes. In, in the value and pay for performance environment that I just spoke to, there's an increased focus on outcomes, whether they be cost outcomes or economic outcomes or health outcomes. Payers, pharmacists, and other stakeholders are beginning to hone, in, hone a focus in on the different outcomes that uh, could be um, delivered upon through pharmacist-provided care. To achieve these outcomes, though, collaboration will be necessary. The third, the third trend there is alignment. And so we have all heard about our mega mergers that are occurring in the market and how, whether it be horizontal or vertical, these mergers are creating an uh, alignment within the market. And what pharmacists and payers are beginning to experience is the need to align from a clinical perspective, an operational perspective, and of course, a payment and incentives perspective. The fourth trend there is data. So it's data standardization, data interoperability, data access, data management. All of these hot topics came up 
throughout the industry survey and the multi-stakeholder task force. Data is uh, certainly a trend and optimizing the use of this data and how it is being managed is, of course, a challenge for both payers and pharmacists. And the channels to use this data certainly exist, but need to be better optimized and better utilized. The fifth trend there is collaboration. I've spoken to collaboration uh, quite a bit here in the beginning of our uh, webinar, and this collaboration from what we learned in the trends will require the right people at the right time, establishing a level of trust and transparency um, uh, between all stakeholders that are participating in this collaboration. There are also, there's also a new and emerging role for neutral entities in order to step in and facilitate these types of collaborations. So these five trends were seen throughout all of the, the industry survey as well as the multi-stakeholder task force and really provide a foundation to the recommendations that are throughout the report and today that we'll be discussing on today's webinar. So this is your prompt or this is your reminder, your subtle reminder to submit your questions. We're starting to dive into the content here. And I want to make sure that you all have an opportunity to provide feedback and submit your questions to us here such that we can answer them. Now let's dive into the first set of five recommend recommended actions. So we'll start with the healthcare payers, and these are the five actions to expand pharmacist-provided care. I won't necessarily read these to you as we'll cover them individually here throughout the succession of slides. But as you can see, there are a number of the hot topics and trends that we've discussed are represented here uh, with, uh, with actions, uh, actions to address them. So let's look at the first uh, action here. So form risk-sharing partnerships with community pharmacists in a sustainable way to deliver patient care. So risk sharing came up quite frequently and um, throughout the, the process of this project. And really what we found is that the payers were looking for more risks, uh, risk to be taken by community pharmacists in order to uh, deliver or build better collaborations or uh, more equal collaborations. So in looking at risk sharing and what it leads to, when risk sharing is established, uh, we there in many ways was um, more sustainability to collaborations, and that sustainability really came from rewards when payers, excuse me, when pharmacists were successful, and ultimately with the sustainability of the risk sharing and these partnerships, transformation would come from that. So further support of that transformation would really come from payers supporting community pharmacists in their ability to deliver better care and more value to not only them as payers, but also to patients as well. In looking at our second recommendation, implement hybrid reimbursement models with pharmacists that combine fee-for-service with value-based care. So we've mentioned that the market is moving from volume to value and fee for service to performance uh, to pay for performance. And now what we're looking to do in that transition is to find these hybrid reimbursement models to bridge that transition. What we found is that uh, reimbursement for pharmacist provided care is building um, building on and separate from dispensing. So these types of setups, these types of hybrid reimbursement models have been successful or shown some promise by early adopters in Medicare Part D, specialty and chronic care management. So those are certainly opportunities to test out these models within your organization and see exactly how successful they can be. So let's look at an example of both the application of risk sharing as well as hybrid reimbursement. So in one particular example uh, that was cited to us 
we had a collaboration between community pharmacists and healthcare payers. On the left there, the community pharmacists maintained uh, patients' participation in a medication synchronization program. As a result, and as a, as a result of this regular inter excuse me, regular engagement with the patient, they were able to provide care such as immunizations and medication therapy management. And then, as a result of the delivery of care, the community pharmacists achieved shared outcomes. And in this particular example, medication adherence was the outcome that was sought out at, by both the community pharmacists pharmacists and the healthcare payers. So in looking at the healthcare payer side of things, we're looking at the, the healthcare payer shared data that uh, with pharmacists in order to identify a small group of high-risk patients that could be enrolled in a medication synchronization program. The healthcare payer also paid for medication synchronization enrollment as well as a monthly fee per member for the continued enrollment in that program. They also paid for the pharmacist provided care that was delivered as a result of the regular intervention or regular engagement with the patient. And then of course, shared a performance related bonus with pharmacists when shared outcomes and goals were achieved. So again, this was a, an example of not only how the hybrid reimbursement model could be applied, but also how pharmacists and payers could begin to interact and form risk-sharing partnerships. The risk share here was, of course, the community pharmacist went out uh, and invested in a medication synchronization program and dedicated time and resources to those patients at the risk of uh, not receiving or not achieving this performance-related, uh, excuse me, achieving those performance outcomes and therefore receiving the performance-related bonus. And of course, the healthcare payer went at risk by uh, reaching out to the pharmacist and indicating that and providing this small group of high-risk patients um, that needed the intervention and allowing them to take care of, rather allowing the community pharmacist to take care of the adherence, um, adherence goals that they needed to achieve. So that's an example of how actions one and two for our payers were applied and uh, implemented in the marketplace. Let's look at our third action here of establishing a system-wide infrastructure to support value-based contracts. What we learned throughout the industry survey as well as the task force is that value-based contracts are being established and implemented throughout the market in some form or fashion uh, between payers and pharmacies. We do not, that, that said, the infrastructure that exists uh, is not being optimized to share the successes or to um, better track those value-based contracts and the, the success that they have. So the action here is to build the infrastructure or better utilize the existing infrastructure and have it focus on goal, metrics, and outcomes that are shared by both the payer and pharmacy. And as a result, what we'd look to see is that the infrastructure would allow for the tracking, um, tracking of these types of contracts that would be secure, transparent, and interoperable for both payers and pharmacies to reference and use as examples when they're looking to establish these types of contracts uh, with other organizations and stakeholders. From this infrastructure, we would also look to see or look expect to see uh, a the consistent delivery of care, not only consistent for the payer to understand what's being provided, but also the patient and the patient experience becomes more consistent as these value-based contracts are established and better standardized across the infrastructure. These, uh, the contracts, the value-based contracts have been utilized uh, beginning here in Medicare, but there's certainly an opportunity once this infrastructure is either built or better utilized, uh, there's an opportunity that exists within commercial and Medicaid markets. So 
So looking at our fourth action for the payers, improve data sharing to enhance pharmacists' role in outcomes-based healthcare. So of course, we received a number of calls for improved data sharing throughout the process uh, of the survey and stakeholder task force. But what we look to do is utilize the channels that exist. Technology vendors are providing or have uh, have provided a number of different channels where this data can be shared. So what data that what data exists or what data needs to be shared? We have the clinical care data, so that would be lab results such as A1C, uh, diagnoses, um, and that of course would need to be combined with or shared with and brought together with pharmacy data, so that uh, the data that would be available at the pharmacy level whether it be a, the fill history or the delivery of any certain type of care. And then of course, we would wanna combine that clinical care data and pharmacy data with the payer claims data. So the uh, provision or the sharing of all three, type, all, all three of those uh, different types of data would in many ways, uh, once sent through the channels that, channels that exist would produce outcomes for all three entities and stakeholders that would be involved. That includes the patient, the pharmacist, and the payer. And finally, our fifth action for the payers is to use outcomes-based quality performance measure sets to align pharmacy services in vertically integrated clinical care. So the verbose action there, one of the most verbose actions there, can, um, I encourage you to look into the report and read the, the more thorough description of, um, of the action, but we'll cover it at a high level here. So we've talked about vertical, vertical integration here in the market, and really everyone has a role to play. All of the healthcare system stakeholders that are listed there on the left of the slide have a role to play. Those patients, pharmacists, providers, health systems, health plans, and PBMs, everyone has a role. Pharmacists have the opportunity to demonstrate their value when utilizing vertically integrated measure sets. Those measure sets would combine, or rather connect, a pharmacist's impact to not only those uh, those uh, measures that they're most commonly known to have an impact on, such as adherence, CMR, and statin use in patients with diabetes. But they would also allow pharm the pharmacist impact to be seen throughout the uh, all quality evaluation systems on all per quality performance measures. The example that's listed there is, of course, applicable to diabetes, but of course, there are is an opportunity to establish these vertically integrated measure sets in different uh, disease states and other clinical areas, such as pain management and opioid use. So with that, we've covered the five actions for payers. We have quite a few questions coming in uh, that I have Richard here helping me manage and work, work our way through. But I do encourage you to submit your questions and comments in the chat box, and we'll work our way through those questions uh, towards the end of the webinar. So in looking at those five actions, I'm very curious which, ones, which one of the five actions is most actionable in your organization. So we're going to do another poll here. I encourage you to look at the results that, excuse me, the actions that are listed there, those that we've just worked our way through. And tell me, which one of the five actions is most actionable for your organization? So we'll give about 10 more seconds for the responses to come into the poll.
Excellent. So let's look at our results. Which of the results are most actionable? And it looks like the top ones here with 23% of the poll and 28, I should say. The, the top two here are those at the bottom, improve data sharing to enhance the pharmacist's role, as well as use outcomes-based performance measures in order to align pharmacy services and care. This is excellent feedback. I appreciate the, the engagement and the provision of this information. We will certainly plan to use it, and I encourage you to pursue those actions that you found more, most actionable within your organization. Well, let's look at the community pharmacist now. So we have five actions here for the community pharmacist. Again, I won't read all of these to you. What we'll do is our work our way through these, as well as a few examples of how pharmacist-provided care is being delivered successfully. So the first one, implement a pharmacy operating model focused on pharmacist-provided care. The pharmacy operating model as we know it uh, must change. Uh, volume is no longer sufficient uh, to support the community pharmacy business or provide care to our patients. So what we're, what the new model, uh, the pharmacy operating model needs to begin to focus on is not only pharmacist provided care, but the elements of patient engagement that are uh, key to that pharmacist provided care. The pharmacist provided care model and that uh, the implementation of it is really would really best position a community pharmacy uh, both clinically as well as financially in order to uh, better deliver care as well as achieve outcomes not only that the pharmacy is looking to achieve but also the payer and the patient. So um, early adopters that we discussed or that we uh, heard from and the early adopters of the pharmacist provided care model found opportunities in partnerships with different stakeholders, such as uh, a number of payers and employer groups. They also found opportunities within chronic disease state management, preventative services, performance enhancements, such as that which we just discussed with, related to medication synchronization. And of course, the model or a pharmacy as a total cost of care solution, so those this model being implemented in a way that reduces the total cost of care for employers, for payers, and obviously the patients that are contributing to, or rather paying for the care. Looking at the second item here, we're looking to train frontline pharmacists to successfully transition to a pharmacist provided care model. So we just spoke about how the pharmacist provided care model needed to be implemented at the pharmacy level. Now what we need to do is train those frontline pharmacists to successfully transition to that model. And this would uh, involve the educational resources and training to help them embrace the new model, uh, keep their clinical skills current, uh, strategies to identify opportunities for care and intervention, they would also, this training would look to explain new reimbursement processes that would come along with the pharmacist provided care model. And then of course, looking to train them on technology and uh, help them overcome the data barriers. And of course, a lot of this uh, training would uh, need to be implemented across different train, different, excuse me, different chains. But those frontline pharmacists are integral or critical to the successful transition to the pharmacist provided care model in, in the community pharmacy. The third item that we hear that we have here, third action item rather, is optimize efficiencies and efficacy of care delivery to allow pharmacies to be profitable while delivering value, valuable care. So, of course, when it comes to the delivery of care, pharmacists um, have the opportunity or a will, will need to require, rather, pharmacists will need to find a balance that works for your organization. That 
balance would be of time, resources, and reimbursement. In order to find that balance, that collaboration with payers will be necessary in order to um, ensure that the balance is appropriate, that the that there is a level of profit for the pharmacy in delivering care and sustaining the pharmacist provided care model. And of course, the um, Collaboration will be necessary in order to ensure that valuable care is delivered to both the pharmacist, excuse me, the payer, and the patient. There are a number of resources that exist uh, out there um, in the marketplace and in, um, in the literature. I encourage you to seek out uh, toolkits from the American Pharmacists Association, as they have a number of different uh, toolkits and resources that are available to help pharmacies identify what the balance of time, resources, and reimbursement should be in order to deliver care. The fourth action here for our community pharmacists is to standardize patient engagement and care delivery to provide consistent clinical care and optimal outcomes across diverse patient populations. So standard, organizations must standardize how the patient is engaged. This is uh, the standardization that would occur at an organization level. And uh, medication synchronization, uh, I believe, offers, the, offers an opportunity to begin to standardize that, uh, that the care delivery. In this way, in the, care in the standardization of care delivery, patients can better know what to expect from their pharmacy and the opportunities that their pharmacy, pharmacy and pharmacists have to offer, but also payers begin to better understand and come to and know what to expect from certain services that are being offered by community pharmacies. So the standardization would not only need to occur at the pharmacy level, but again, across the organization itself. And again, the standardization would look to achieve consistency in the delivery of, of care, as well as how the patient is being engaged, such that patients and payers know what to expect from pharmacies uh, when it comes to their ability to deliver care. And finally, the fifth action for our community pharmacists, educate stakeholders about pharmacists as essential and effective, excuse me, essential, effective, and accountable care providers. So uh, there is a growing uh, amount of data, literature, and evidence to indicate that pharmacists are essential, effective, and, account and accountable care providers. Now pharmacists need to get the word out. In doing so, they can not only get the word out to, um, to pharmacists or rather other pharmacists, we need to expand those, the, the stakeholder groups to which we speak uh, and promote our, uh, a, phar a pharmacist's ability to be essential, effective, and accountable. So those groups are payers or insurers, uh, but it's also fellow members of the medical team, employers, and patients and ad those advocates of patients. These are the, the main stakeholder groups that could truly benefit from better understanding how, a, how valuable a pharmacist can be on the care team and in the delivery of care. So keep those questions coming in. Um, I really appreciate the responses. Uh, we've gotten some questions and some uh, uh, some very um, excited uh, uh, responses to some of these actions. So let's keep uh, that re those responses and questions coming in. And let's take another opportunity to see exactly what resonated with you all. So we'll launch a poll here about what action of the five actions for community pharmacists is the most actionable in your organization.
All right, so we're still getting votes in or polls in, but in order to make sure we're, we end in time, uh, we'll go ahead and close the poll. Let's look at the results here. It looks like 31% of the respondents have an opportunity within educating stakeholders. But then at second place there, we'll, uh, looking to train the frontline pharmacists to successfully implement the pharmacist provided care model. Excellent. Again, I encourage you to take these actions and, um, and begin to um, act on or use this action guide within your organization. And our final section here are the pharmacists and payers together. So these five actions are for those state, two stakeholder groups to take um, in collaboration, to take on in collaboration rather. So let's dive into them. The first one here is identify clinical areas to expand the use and demonstrate the value of pharmacist provided care. So what we found is uh, throughout the project process is that there were a number of different areas, clinical areas that um, separately were being spoken to um, as opportunities. Um, and they were being spoken to separately by pharmacists and payers. Some of those uh, can be acted on. Uh, for example, the areas that were mentioned were mental and behavioral health. A few more opportunities within cardiovascular health related to congestive heart failure or stroke. And of course, pain management was uh, a very popular um, area for potential collaboration and of shared interest. So once these areas are identified, you can use this checklist here. Um, the checklist is really in order to ensure that everyone moving forward with a discussion and a collaboration within the expanded area of or the expanded, expanded clinical area, everyone's on the same page. So we have clear goals, program responsibilities, the implementation requirements for different programs related to this expanded um, the expanded clinical area. And then, of course, appropriate reporting, measurement, incentives, and reimbursement. So what we found is that uh, there were a number of different uh, pilot programs that were cited as um, excellent opportunities to try out the uh, potential collaboration in these other, uh, in these additional areas. And, um, Throughout these pilot programs, it could lead to the refinement of not only the best practices and the accreditation standard and guidelines, but also it could um, identify a, a, an area that both payers and pharmacists could really build a program that could be successful in delivering pharmacists provided care. So let's look at number two here. The second action is identified shared patient outcomes and goals for pharmacists pharmacies, and payers. So during the task force uh, effort, we put the those that were identifying with the pharmacy side of things on one side of the room, and we put those that were identifying as payers on the other side of the room and asked them to identify uh, the outcomes and goals for which they were, which they were focused on. This was the result. And what you can see here, I really want to focus in on the, the shared there, is that we found that both groups were um, interested in chronic disease management, total cost of care, medication adherence, appropriate medication use, as well as outcomes measures. So these, this, this uh, area in between, it was interesting that um, there were a number of stakeholders that were surprised by this overlap. And really we found that these two stakeholder groups were talking about the same thing with, but using different language. So we have these shared outcomes here and we feel that they are common ground for collaboration. Speaking of collaboration, here's an opportunity. We have a challenge that presents itself with the pharmacy point of care testing and point of care data that's not being uh, accepted by HEDIS and those re reporting requirements for the evaluation program, the HEDIS evaluation program. 
As a result, the exclusion of this relevant and clinical data uh, limits the payer's ability to really understand the value of, uh, that, of pharmacy's contribution to the payer's achievement of these HEDIS measures. So there's an opportunity here for pharmacists to perform the point of care testing, such as A1C, and provide that data for HEDIS reporting. And um, this, um, the message here is that uh, pharmacists are ready to provide these tests as part of patient care and can be valuable in a plan's performance on these HEDIS measures. There are efforts underway to pursue this uh, collaboration opportunity, and I encourage you to um, submit in the questions and comments box here if you're interested in supporting that effort. Our third strategy here is to align strategies among pharmacies and payers to integrate the value of pharmacist-provided care. I mentioned in the trends that alignment was, a, was an issue or whether it was a hot uh, trend that was being spoken to quite frequently during the project process. But the alignment of strategies and business lines needed to occur. So strategy, the strategies that needed to align were those that were clinical, operational, and payment or incentive. Um, and they could align with all three lines of business, the Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial lines of business. So when pharmacies and payers are able to collaborate and align those strategies, it would truly it would truly add to the value of pharmacist provided care and support its successful implementation. When, uh, number four here, I simply left it at a statement there instead of a visual, as I wanted to as as action four is to implement pharmacist-provided care in all community pharmacies. So as we have spoken to a number of times here, pharmacist-provided care is a sustainable and effective model that moves the pharmacy beyond fee-for-service to value-based care. And as a result, the task force group um, and those that participated in this process truly feel that it, there is an opportunity for it to be implemented in all community pharmacies. And our final action here comes with a diagram and a story. So um, the fifth action, prioritize patients to receive pharmacist-provided care across all payers. What's been laid out here um, is um, it's a scenario that happens very frequently on the front lines of community pharmacy. And um, the opportunity that exists is to um, align payers and pharmacy, pharmacists in their efforts to prioritize patients. In looking at this example, Plan A submits 10 high-priority patients to, the, to the pharmacy. Plan B also submits 10 patients to, the, to that same pharmacy. And Plan C also submits 10 patients to, um, to that pharmacy. The pharmacy is now now has a list of 30 high priority patients, and uh, is is left wondering how how to manage the 30 patients with the limitations that they have on both time, resources, and uh, the ability to deliver the care. So, in order to solve for this, a number of our stakeholders spoke to opportunities. Those opportunities within collaboration are to Im improve data sharing, or excuse me, sharing of patient information. Um, it's also to, in these collaborations, to address this prioritization, is to have reasonable performance expectations. And then, of course, a pharmacy could look at the appropriate staffing resources available in the pharmacy to meet the needs of those contracted populations. So again, um, Pharmacists and payers can come together to begin to prioritize patients across all payers, understanding that there is a multi-payer market out there. The prioritization of these patients will truly benefit the patients themselves, as well as a pharmacist's ability to effectively deliver pharmacist-provided care. So with that, 
we have completed all 15 of our actions here. And I want to make sure that we have an opportunity to look at what actionable action is of these five actions are most actionable within your organization. So let's look at that here. We'll do another poll very quickly as we're coming up on the end of our time. And we'll close the poll here and see what our results are. So it looks like the most popular one, uh, the most actionable, rather, items on here are to align the strategies um, with the close second and third coming from identifying clinical areas to expand uh, the use of pharmacist-provided care as well as to prioritize patients. So again, I encourage you to, to not only just submit that information to us in response to this poll, but begin to pursue that action with your, within your organization. If they seem actionable for your, you and your organization, we encourage you to uh, pursue that action. So again, keep submitting those questions and comments. I know we're coming up on the end of our hour here, and uh, what we will be able to do is follow up via email in order to answer those questions. But again, in closing here, let's look at the future. Uh, the future that will require and will really um, showcase and, um, and value collaboration between pharmacists, payers, and technology vendors and other, other stakeholders. So as we know, pharmacists are positioned to deliver care and really engage with the patient at a, with a holistic approach. When we have a market that's moving from volume to value, we must find an opportunity to, we must find collaborations rather that will, I, that will meet the needs of both the, the patient, the payer, and others. Pharmacist provided care uh, very clearly became, uh, uh, as a result of this, of this project, Pharmacist provided care very clearly became the clear winner as uh, or clear opportunity for the future of pharmacy here, but it will require partnership, cooperation, and collaboration. So let's uh, look at um, let's ta use the action guide that's been created and all of those um, all of those actions in order to pursue pharmacist provided care as well as. Uh, expand uh, the adoption of pharmacist provided care. I want to thank those that have participated in the process of developing the pharmacist provided care action guide. Um, and I encourage you to not only have, not only you read the pharmacist provided care action guide, but I encourage you to share the action guide, the 15 recommendations there, the real world examples, and the industry trends that we all covered here on the webinar, but are definitely gone, uh, in, definitely have more detail um, about in the, in the action guide. So a reminder about the upcoming events and opportunities. The PQA annual meeting is coming up next month. The PQA continuing education, the, uh, the educational needs assessment is still available and we encourage you to submit your results or excuse me, submit your feedback. And of course, look into the Directions in Pharmacy uh, event as PQA will be a keynote at that particular event speaking to opioids. So I want to thank you all for joining the webinar. I know we have two minutes left here, um, but what I will plan to do is individually follow up with you all via email with the information um, and I encourage you to, if you're, if we end the webinar and you're reviewing the action guide, uh, please submit your questions uh, to me via that email address. And of course, once we close this uh, webinar, it will uh, prompt you to fill out a survey. We value your feedback and appreciate um, the candidness of that feedback. So please submit um, submit your feedback through that survey.
Once again, thank you very much for attending the April PQA Quality Forum webinar. We look forward to continuing to work with you all as PQA members and potentially seeing you next month at the PQA annual meeting.